Well, dear congregation, it is great to be back today. I think this is my fifth conference, right? Fifth pillars. What's going to happen when you don't invite me back? Will that ever be the case? The rapture will happen. <laughs> <laughs> the rapture will have happened. The Bible is a big book, 66 books in the Bible. I found one, one website and it figured out how many chapters were in the Bible. Any guesses? 1,189 chapters. How many verses do you think are in the Bible? 31,000 verses. How many words do you think are in the Bible? 807,000 words in the Bible. How do you get your mind around that? How do you say, you know, I need to understand this book because it's important that I do. God is speaking. God has revealed himself. There's a lot on the line. Heaven, hell, judgment, forgiveness, the person and work of Christ. It's important for us to get our arms around the Bible, but it seems so big. Is it possible? In addition, God wants you to know the Bible. So out of 800 and 800,000 words, how do I get my mind wrapped around the Bible and how do I understand it? Well, the Lord has helped us and he's helped us by giving us an answer or a guidebook or a pathway to understanding it in the very first book of the Bible. And when I say the first book of the Bible, I don't mean Genesis, I mean the book of Job. So take your Bibles and turn to Job, please, this morning. I said to myself, I don't know why in the world we're singing this song to start off the service, Ancient Words. But it works out perfectly because Job is the oldest book maybe ever written in all the world. And when I read the lyrics again to the song, holy words long preserved for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope give us strength. And so my Joy this morning is to talk about the book of Job and how it gives us a road map for all the Bible. When I was younger, I was about five foot tall and I played in a five foot and under basketball league. I, I grew to be about six one and a quarter and now I'm about five eleven and a half. So you know, as my kids were growing, I was shrinking. And I went to a bad part of Omaha, and my mom and dad took me down there, and I played center because I was exactly five foot tall. And I remember walking over to the other center of the team and tried to shake his hand. He didn't shake my hand, and he looked at me, and he said, if you don't let me win the jump ball, I'm going to kill you after the game. <laughs> I didn't have all my adult teeth yet. I thought, oh, what in the world? I tried my hardest, but I still lost. And my dad was there to protect me, and I'm obviously still alive. What does that have to do with anything? Nothing, but it's interesting. It, remi it reminds me of basketball. In basketball, in that five foot and under league, I was taught by the coach. You don't look at someone and throw the pass, because the defender would recognize that and intercept the pass. And when you look at someone and pass the ball to them, that's called telegraphing the pass. And so you're not to telegraph the pass. You're to look one way, and like Magic Johnson, throw the ball the other way. But when it comes to Bible interpretation, did you know that the book of Job telegraphs the paths of Bible interpretation so that you're assisted in how to understand the Bible? It's very direct. It tells you right from the get-go in this most early book of the Bible what you should be looking for in other books of the Bible to help you interpret it. And it's almost counterintuitive because most people don't know much about Job. How can Job help me interpret the Bible when I can't even interpret Job? I mean, when's the last time you read Job? It's, it's difficult. Technically speaking, what Job is doing is not telegraphing the past. That's just kind of Nebraska ease. It's a literary device called foreshadowing, where the author puts some clues in early to help you look for things later. And maybe you think of something like Agatha Christie novel where you see there's an ice pick in chapter one and she is letting you know, be prepared for something that's coming up later in chapter four where that ice pick is used for something dastardly. And so one writer says of foreshadowing, quote, foreshadowing is often used in the early stages of a novel or at the start of a chapter as it can subtly create tension and set readers' expectations regarding how the story will unfold. 
For instance, in a mystery novel, it might use foreshadowing in an early chapter by mentioning something that seems inconsequential, but is actually a clue. And so we're going to look at the book of Job today because it does this literary thing called foreshadowing, telegraphing the past so that you can understand Job better and also the Bible. Maybe I could say it this way when I'm thinking about murders and mysteries and all that stuff. When I grew up in Nebraska, it was, and the older folks here will know the detective shows, we grew up with Mannix and um, Beretta. Um, was that his name? Beretta? Yeah, yeah, Beretta. Uh, McLeod. The, all the old people, the geriatrics, are all shaking their head. Go ahead, Del. <laughs> <laughs> and the one that I probably liked the most was Columbo, right? Peter Falk, kind of this disheveled detective and a brown beige jacket, and he's just all frumpled and everything. But he kept saying, you know, as he walked out of there, now just one more thing. Just one more thing. And this is kind of like what we're going to do today in the book of Job. It's just, just one more thing. There's something that really bothers me, and he kind of comes to the conclusion, oh yes, this person did it, and then they kind of confess. So we're going to look at this morning, here's our outline. Three detective-like questions, Columbo-like questions, found in Job, designed to help you read your Bible. Three questions in Job that help you read all of your Bible three clues in Job, so that you'll try to find those clues in the 65 books of the Bible, specifically in the Old Testament. And that's our theme in the conference, how do you see Christ in the Old Testament, and it will be directly related. So we're going to have three questions we'll see in Job that help you understand the Bible and see the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I first thought about it this way when my son and I were driving in California, and we were just in the car, relaxing, listening to Bob Marley on the radio. And my son said, Dad, can I turn off the radio? Can I turn off the radio? Well, yeah, yeah, turn off the radio. You're not going to believe what I've been learning in Abner Chow's Job class. It's unbelievable. He's helping me see the Bible. He's helping me see what to look for. And, and I, I'm just so excited about it. And I thought, praise the Lord that my son would be excited about that. So I thought, well, I better go listen to lectures. And I did. And I want to make sure I, I give credit to Abner because he's the one that helped me initially think about this, and then I'll put my own Abendrothian spin on it. How's that? Now, before we get into Job and the outline, let's talk a little bit about Job in general. John said I had about 95 minutes this morning, so that'll work out perfectly. Longest sermon I ever preached at a church was 92 minutes. Why 92 minutes? Because cassettes in the old days said 90 minutes, max L 90, but they were really 46 minutes on each side. And so the pastor in Los Angeles said, at 46 minutes, look at the sound booth and go like this. <laughs> Tell them to flip over the tape, hit record again. So I did 92 minutes. I don't think this will be quite as long. So intro to Job, then the outline. Okay, so far so good. Listen to what a few people said about Job. The book of Job is perhaps the greatest masterpiece of the human mind. Victor Hugo. Daniel Webster, the book of Job taken as a mere work of literary genius is one of the most wonderful productions of any age or of any language. Thomas Carlyle, call this book one of the grandest things ever written. There's nothing written, I think, of equal literary merit. Another man said, tomorrow if all literature was to be destroyed and it was left to me to retain one work only, I would save Job. Luther, it is magnificent and sublime as no other book in Scripture. And then lastly, David Klein's. It's the most intense book theologically and intellectually of the Old Testament. I mean, for people to say that, both unbelievers and believers, it makes me think, I probably should get to know the book of Job better. Job is in the poetical section, as you know, right? You've got the Pentateuch or the Torah in the first five books of the Bible. Then you have historical books. Uh, you've got books like Esther and Judges. And then we come to the poetical section. Some call it a wisdom section. And so that's the part of the Bible that this is in, the wisdom section. You say, well, when was it written? What's the timing of Job? Job has not said anything in this book about Mosaic law. So it's probably before Moses. He said he's a priest in his own family. That's what happened in patriarchal period. He is deemed to be wealthy because he had cattle and animals. That's also patriarchal. And he lives 140 years after his trials had ended. So that puts him about the same time period as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who wrote the book of Job? 
Well, we know the Holy Spirit wrote the book of Job, but many people think Job might have written it, um, Solomon might have written it, Isaiah might have written it. It doesn't really matter who wrote it because we'll see Paul quotes it in 1 Corinthians 3 and Romans chapter 11. And the last thing I want to say about the book of Job is this, and I'll form it as a question. What's the purpose of Job? If you had a little test in Bible school or you were trying to study at home and you said, I want to get my mind wrapped around the purpose of Bible books. I know what the purpose of Genesis is or Romans or Revelation. What's the purpose of Job? And most people say, so we can suffer well. Perseverance in suffering. Uh, some people will say, how to deal with evil, theodicy, how to explain evil. I think those things are interesting. How should the righteous suffer? How is, how is God defending himself against Satan's attacks? That might be right. But here's what I think is really happening. When you suffer, you ask the right questions. When you're suffering, you're on your deathbed, you're sick, your family's sick, you're going through a trial, surgery's impending, financial woes, marital woes, you begin to ask the right questions. And I think that the lens of suffering, the lens of theodicy, the lens of what about evil, is just that, a lens, so that you ask the right questions. And did you know one of the major themes in the book of Job is comfort? To quote Pat Abendroth, what in the world? Do you say that sometimes? I think Dad used to say that. Do I sound like Pat? Or does Pat sound like me? Who's older? I mean, Pat's nine years older. That's amazing. here. Sometime, search through the word comfort in the book of Job. You'll find verses like this, that Job's three friends in chapter 2 made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and to comfort him. Chapter 6, this would be my comfort. I could even exult in pain unsparing. Chapter 7, my bed will comfort me. Chapter 15, the comforts of God. Chapter 16, comforters you all. Chapter 21, this be your comfort. Chapter 21, will you comfort me with empty nothings? Chapter 29, chapter 42, the word comfort is over and over and over. And if you read the book of Job and you understand it properly, you can ask questions like this and find answers. Does God love me? I'm hurting. Does God care? I'm suffering. Does God even notice? I'm in a lot of pain. I don't know if anybody can identify with any of those things, but for all of us in this fallen world, we need to know the answers to those questions. Does God care? Does he notice? Is there any comfort? Well, if you look at Job chapter 1 and 2, you'll see why there's comfort needed. And we haven't even gotten to the outline yet, but I know me, uh, I, I, myself, I don't really know much about Job, and so I need to learn about it, and so that's why I'm trying to set the table before we get in the passage. You know how the book of Job starts. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That's Job 1.1. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Notice he had lots of possessions. His sons used to go and hold a feast at verse 4. Uh, they would consecrate them in verse 5. And there was a day, verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking in it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth. Now repeated, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And of course you know the story. Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Right, you've put a hedge around him, you've blessed him, you've put your hand on him. But now, verse 11, put forth your hand from him, touch all that he has, he'll surely curse you to his face. And you know what happened? One tragedy after another, after another. Major tragedies, no minor things. Verse 20, And then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped. Naked I have come from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Comfort needed? Absolutely. Let's go to the outline. Three questions that will help you read your Bible and understand it, telegraphing the past, putting clues in. What should I be looking for when I read the Bible? Number one, does God forgive sin? Question number one, does God forgive sin? By the way, if he does forgive sin, I know he cares. I know he loves me. I know he's concerned. I know he's not just transcendent and holy and other, but he's close and intimate. He's not just far off, he's near. Does God forgive sin? That's the first question. Turn to Job chapter 7. That's true comfort. What we're going to do is we're going to look at three passages from Job to answer these three questions. I would know if God cares if he forgave my sin. Does he? Job 7, 7. Remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me, Job says, will behold me no more. While your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him anymore. Hope needed? Does he care? Is there comfort? I mean, in verse 19, this is kind of interesting. How long will you not look away from me, nor leave me alone till I swallow my spit? It's like you're hovering over me, God. I, I'm, I'm so nervous and I'm so concerned, I can't even swallow my spit. Sometimes I want to be a youth group leader just so I could talk about spitting. I'll do that later. And now we come to this question about forgiveness, verse 20. If I sin, what do I do to you, you watcher of mankind? Why have you made me your mark? Why have I become a burden to you? Here's the question. Question number one, it will help you look for these answers in the rest of your Bible. Does God forgive sin? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I shall lie in the earth. You will seek me, but I shall not be. That word for pardon right there in verse 21 is the same word where we get for Passover. God, God, you know me, you scrutinize me, you sift me, you winnow me, but is there forgiveness? I'm suffering, I'm hurting, and it's one thing to suffer, but it's another thing to suffer knowing that you're forgiven. The relationship is severed, I know I've sinned against you, and if I could just have that closeness of forgiveness, like I could put it this way maybe, when I do something stupid and sinful, uh, toward my wife and there's a breach in our relationship I pretty much can't get anything else done I, I just have that desire and that yearning uh, for peace and for reconciliation and there's a breach between us because I've, I've sinned against her and, and there's something wrong and so finally when I can humble myself and I go to my wife and I say honey I've, I've sinned against the Lord I've asked him to forgive me and I've sinned against you would you please forgive me and then she says what? No way. <laughs> Try harder, grovel more. She says, of course I do. What's that feeling that you get when there's reconciliation with you and your spouse, our children, our work coworkers? I mean, that's what you're looking for. That's what you want. You're thinking, oh, we're together. I, I feel that, I sense that, that subjective feeling, but also it's true and objective. That's where real comfort is. When you're suffering, you're, you're asking the right questions. When you're on your deathbed thinking you're gonna die of COVID in the hospital, you're thinking, eternity's long, God's holy, I'm sinful. I don't really care what Joe Biden's policies are. I don't really care if the Cleveland Browns are winning. I, I need to know exactly what's going on. Does God forgive sin? And that's early on in the book of Job because the rest of the book of Job and the rest of the Old Testament, yes, even the rest of the New Testament, you need to be looking for, does God forgive sin? Wasn't that David's cry in Psalm 51 after he'd sinned with Bathsheba? And he said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Probably when you hear about sin, you have been well taught at this church, and you know that God doesn't just say, let men be forgiven, like he says, let there be light. Why doesn't God do that? I mean, he can create the world. Why doesn't he just say, forgiven? Because God is holy, and the wages of sin is death, something has to die because sin is so bad and you begin to look at the Bible thinking one of the number one questions in all the world is 
does God forgive sin? And you begin to notice things like, yes, he does through a substitute. I should probably be looking for substitution in the Bible. When my kids were little, I'd always say to them, what's the most important concept theologically in the Bible? Uh, Jesus? Yes, that's true. But more than that, what did Jesus do? Because I don't want to separate who Jesus is and what he's done. And I'd say, the most important concept is substitution. Substitution. You begin to look at the Bible saying, I need to start looking at how does God forgive sin? He's so holy, he just doesn't pronounce sin forgiven. It's not like the indulgent father, Lloyd-Jones says, who says, all right, my child, all is well, come back. Bygones be bygones, I know you've sinned. Our grandmother, Nona, she babysitted me on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays when mom worked at Mutual of Omaha and other parent, grandparents on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so I remember grandma would always say, because grandpa was sick, dying of cancer, she'd say, Mike, now if you keep disobeying that yardstick over there, that you got at the hardware store, that yellow one, that's going to be on your backside. She kept saying that. She never did it. So one day I went over, grabbed the ruler, broke it over my knee, and handed it to Grandma. And she still didn't spank me. <laughs> Whoa. I'm a grandpa now, and I think whatever I spank my kids, oh, grandkids. Is that how God acts? It's no big deal. You break his law, transgression, and it's just done? Of course not. God is holy. And so there has to be a substitute to have reconciliation, to have forgiveness. You can see that even back in Genesis. You begin to read the Bible and you think, after Adam and Eve sinned, what did God do? By his own initiation, he kills the animals and he covers Adam and Eve. Pretty soon you read Exodus 12. And you say to yourself, I see what's going on. I'm looking for forgiveness. How does God forgive sin? Well, when one man sins, God kills one animal to cover that sins. Now in Exodus 12, I'm starting to see a bigger picture of forgiveness because when the family sins, one animal is killed for the family in Exodus 12. And then you keep watching and you keep reading your Bible with anticipation. How does God forgive sins? In Leviticus 16, it's not just a man that sins or a woman who sins or a family who sins. It's a nation that sins. And now there's one animal slain for a nation. And you see it telescoping out. And pretty soon you get to John chapter 1, verse 29, and you see John the Baptist who looks at Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of one man, one woman, a family, a nation, or the, the world. We begin to read our Bible, and you should say to yourself, I should be looking for how does God forgive sin? Because it's all leading me to the Lord Jesus. Even offerings in Leviticus. I'm doing the Robert Murray McShane Bible read-through, and I'm now in Leviticus. Anybody else following that program? Okay, so you're in Leviticus too. And some of Leviticus is like, okay, what? What am I going to do? If you start asking the question, how does God forgive sin? Does God forgive sin? Will he forgive sin? And you start reading the offerings that way, you're going to go, this is perfect. There are five main kinds of offerings in the Bible in Leviticus. What does that have to do with anything? Well, first we've got the sin and the guilt offering. And when you sin and you're guilty, there has to be something slain for that. The penalty of the law has to be paid for. But did you know also, there's the burnt offering and the grain offering. And the grain offering and the burnt offering, you light them on fire and the aroma goes up. And it talks about total consecration to God. Positively keeping the law. You've got offerings that say, sin needs to be atoned for. You've got offerings that say, my life is a complete sacrifice to you, God. Complete consecration to you. And then you've got another offering called the peace offering. It's the only one you get to eat. Because when there's been guilt and sin offering paid for and a life of consecration unto God, then you get to sit down and eat the meal and because you're at peace with God. By the way, does that start reminding you of the Lord Jesus Christ? Where he, he pays the penalty of the law that's broken and he lives a life of total consecration? Somebody needs to write a book on the active obedience of Jesus. It'd be a big seller. And then because of that, Confirmed by the resurrection, you have peace with God and you sit and you get to eat the meal. You think, I better go read Leviticus again. That's true. Job is asking the question early on, telegraphing, putting a hint there, putting the, the ice pick, if you will. There has to be forgiveness. Does God forgive? 
It's one thing to suffer. It's another thing to suffer knowing that God forgives my, my sins. You begin to read things like, Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought upon us peace. The first thing Job wants you to do is say, let's distill everything in the world down to three basic questions. Does God forgive sin? Is question one. And by the way, you'll be tracing and looking for the Lord Jesus throughout your entire Bible because we've read the end and we know what to look for. Question number two. Is there a mediator? You know, I'd really know God was kind. He loves me. He cares for me. He's merciful. I know he's holy, but I know he's these other things if he would just give me a mediator. I mean, how could I be in God's court? How can I process, prosecute uh, be prosecuted by God without a helper, without an advocate, without a lawyer. That'd be really dumb. Job 9, please, verses 29 and following. There's real comfort knowing that God forgives sin. And we look for that in the rest of the Bible because it's telegraphed in the first book ever written. In addition, is there a mediator? I would know God loves me and cares for me, Job would say, if there's a mediator. Let's pick it up again in verse 29. I shall be condemned, Job said. Why then do I labor in vain? I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you will plunge me into a pit, and my own clothes will abhor me. Speaking of God, for he is not a man as I am, that I might answer him, that we should come to trial together. There's no arbiter. What's the, what's the NAS say? Pardon me? Umpire, referee, mediator who might lay his hands on both of us. Let him take his rod away from me and let not the dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak without fear of him for I am not so in myself. God is great. God is big. God is transcendent. God is holy. How could I be in his presence? You know what I really need, Job says? If somebody could just put their hand on God, as it were, and then put their hand on me and become a mediator to enact reconciliation, to make sure we're good. I can't do it on my own. So I need someone to step in between us. Is there anybody like that? And I know if God would provide that, I know he'd care. I, I know he'd love me because he's the one that's provided the mediator. I can't provide a mediator. The only mediators I have are my dopey friends. But if God would provide a mediator, at his own expense even, paying the bill of the lawyer for me, as it were, I would know God would care. He wouldn't be far off and just kind of a deistic God. He'd be a hands-on God. Transcendent, yes, but close, yes. And then you begin to read your Bible and you hit Genesis 3.15, that early first gospel, and you're thinking, I see it. I see what he's doing. He could have just crushed them. Adam and Eve. But he's going to crush the serpent's head instead. Is there an arbiter? Is there a referee? My friends aren't good at this. Does God really care? Is he close? I mean, one of the things you feel when you're going through suffering, and when I say feel, I mean feel. When I say think, I mean think. It's like somebody said to me a while ago with the uh, Sarah Young Jesus Calling book when that came out. He said, Mike, how do you feel about the book? I said, well, I feel like throwing up, but, but I think it's really bad theology. That's why we're only on two radio stations in the country. <laughs> when you're suffering, you feel like God's far away. You feel like, well, where are you? I, I'm suffering by myself. I mean, God's a spirit. We can't see him. And so, how do I know you care? How, how do you know you, you even bother with me? There's a lot of people in this world. But if there's a mediator that you would provide, I, I would know. Because you'd be mediating for me through the mediator. That's what he's after here. I can't litigate with God. I can't take my fractured relationship and make it right. Somebody's going to have to help me. 
And so Job says early on in chapter 7, make sure you look for forgiveness of sin theme. But also look for a theme of mediator. How about a priest? Do you think a priest is a good mediator? All the priest language in the Bible? Yes, because a priest stands between God and man. And priests' main job were to sacrifice and to pray. And so you begin to read about priests in the Bible. And you begin to say, oh, that's a foretaste of the ultimate high priest, the Lord Jesus. You begin to say, what kind of person, what kind of entity could put his hand on God, as it were, and put his hand on man? What kind of, what kind of person, thing, or entity would do that? Answer? Someone that would have to be truly God and someone that would have to be truly man. Someone would have to be perfectly God and perfectly man. The God-man could do it. And you start reading your Bible thinking, I know what's coming. I can see it. If God cares for me, he's going to forgive sin through a mediator. By the way, when you start reading the Bible and you start looking at plural pronouns, and you start thinking about other Trinitarian concepts, the only way there could ever be a mediator is if God is triune. Right? The only way there could be a mediator is if God is triune. Father, Son, Spirit. And when you read Psalm 2, for instance, you should be thinking, yes, Job was telegraphing the past so that I might catch it. Psalm 2, I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Now therefore, kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers, serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. But, my word is but, blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's making me think mediator, umpire, arbiter. It's like in an MMA fight or a boxing fight, and they're, they're clenched, and the referee has to come and separate them. That's the exact word there for arbiter or umpire. Or if I read Psalm 110, I'm thinking, yes, back to Job. The Lord says to my Lord, Yahweh says to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. When you read the Bible, don't forget the foreshadowing of Job. Look for forgiveness. You'll know God cares if he forgives. Look for a mediator. You'll know God cares if he provides a mediator. And number three, the third question, is there a resurrection? Is there a resurrection? Does God forgive sin? Is there a mediator? Is there a resurrection? Job 14, please. Is there a resurrection? I mean, after all, if I'm resurrected and I'm in the presence of God, sin must be dealt with. Sin must have been dealt with by God if I'm in His presence. Everything must be okay if I'm in His presence. Holy heaven only accepts holy people. How do you become holy? Job 14, 13. Oh, that you would hide me in shield, that you would conceal me until your wrath be passed, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. Here's the question. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service I would wait till my renewal shall come. I'm desperate. I'm crying out. I need help. I need an anchor. I need stability. Would you call verse 15 and I would answer you? You would long for the works of your hands, for then you would number my steps. You would not keep watch over my sin. My transgression would be sealed up in a bag. And you would cover over my iniquity. But the mountain falls and crumbles away and the rock is removed from its place. The waters wear away the stones and the torrents wash away the soils of the earth so you would destroy the hope of man. Verse 20, you prevail forever against him and he passes. You change his countenance and send him away. His sons come to honor and he does not know it. They're brought low and he perceives it not. He feels only the pain of his own body and he mourns only for himself. Verse 15, you would call, I would answer you, you would long for the work of your hands. I would know you love me if sin is dealt with. 
I think somewhere in the Bible it says something like, I know that my Redeemer lives. Ever heard that song? Where is that found, by the way? Job 19 says the same thing in Job 19. I'm longing for the resurrection. I'm longing to be in your presence. I'm longing to have a Redeemer. I know my Redeemer lives. Job 19, 25. After I die, can I be in your presence? When you're reading your Bible, I want you to catch the telegraph. I should be looking for forgiveness of sins. Because that's going to point me to the Lord Jesus. What I'm really after here is for you to look for Jesus when you're reading your Bible. Pat did a great job last night talking about that. I wonder if there's a mediator. I see flashes of it in, sacrifice, in, in priests. And I wonder if there's a resurrection. How many people were resurrected in the Old Testament? Any guesses? Ten or more, twenty or more, or thirty or more? Which one? They're all wrong. Three. Three. First Kings 17, the widow of Zarephath. If you know the first book of the Bible, Job, the first one written chronologically, and you see that, you're like, okay, I, I'm seeing the clues. I'm catching that pass. The Shunammite woman's son, 2 Kings 4, and the man raised out of Elijah's grave, 2 Kings 13. Not many, but you're seeing this theme. And even in Daniel chapter 12, it talks about resurrected eternal life. All leading, of course, to the Lord Jesus' resurrection. By the way, just on a side note, how many resurrections in the New Testament? What's an easy one? Lazarus, right? That, that's one. Jairus' daughter, the widow, of, uh, the, the widow of Nain's son. And then there's a whole bunch. Remember when Jesus was crucified? He's on the cross at 9 o'clock. At noon it goes dark. The temple curtain is torn from top to bottom. There's an earthquake. And then what happens? The tombs were open up. Lots of dead people are raised from the dead. They wait for the Sabbath to be ended. And on Sunday, they go into town. And they go into town, I'm certain, to say Jesus is alive. Can you imagine you just bury somebody? I don't think it was Moses and Elijah walking around. I think it's people that you actually knew three weeks ago that were dead. And now all of a sudden, they're walking around. By the way, Jesus is alive. When you're reading your Bible, you're looking for the resurrection. So putting everything together, isn't this going to be fun? Yes, it is. Did you know that you can know that God cares for you in your suffering, that he loves you, dear Christian? He's merciful to you, dear Christian, because there is forgiveness of sins for you through the work of a mediator, through the resurrection of the dead. Sound like someone you know? Sound like someone who knows you? You're not giving me much head, no head knocking, but that's a head, head nodding. That's all right. Of course, I can see it. It's so clear. You get forgiveness through a mediator via the resurrection. How should you read your Bible? It's a, it's a road map for you to say, when I'm really hurting, I ask the right questions. When I'm suffering... I need to think rightly. So let me give you a few takeaways from the book of Job in our message today. Number one, don't waste your suffering. Somebody wrote a book called Don't Waste Your Cancer. It was actually a little booklet. It was actually good. So let me just steal that. Don't waste your suffering. When you're suffering, make sure you ask the right questions with your Bibles open. When you're suffering, make sure you ask the right questions with your Bible open. It's funny how suffering, it's not really funny, but it's interesting how suffering cuts out all the noise. And you ask the right questions and you say, Lord, you have my attention. I've talked to many of you because you've shared some of your experiences with suffering or your wife having cancer or your husband and other diseases death in the family. I mean, we're always so busy all the time and listening and phones and everything else. And all of a sudden when this suffering comes out, you think, okay, you have my attention. God, you've dealt with my most important need. 
Can you imagine if you had to suffer like some of your unbelieving friends? When there's no hope at the end? It's one thing to suffer knowing the worst thing that's going to happen to me is glory. It's all taken care of. My sins are forgiven through a mediator, through the resurrection. And by the way, those are all divine things. We could not forgive our own sin. We needed grace. We could not provide ourselves a mediator. We needed grace incarnate. And we could not raise ourselves from the dead. It's all divine, active working of of the Godhead. But don't waste your cancer. When you have, did I just say don't waste your cancer? Don't waste your suffering. Ask the right questions. Look for in the Bible, when your Bible's open, the work of the Lord Jesus. Does this sound familiar to you? For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, who is the testimony given at the proper time. You read about forgiveness, you read about the Lord as mediator, Does this sound familiar to you? When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? You know what Paul's doing there in 1 Corinthians 15? He's taunting death. He's taunting death. When I was in Nebraska, we would have these these chants and stuff for football games, and they were totally Midwestern like kindergarten ones, you know, we've got spirit, yes we do, we've got spirit, how about you? I mean, it's just awful. And then I went to UCLA and they had all these things with, you know, chants and, and, and acrostics and everything else. He's, t- he's taunting. If you ever played baseball when you were a kid, you know, they'd say A better, A better, A better, swing. They're just taunting. Because your sins are forgiven through a mediator via the resurrection, you can say, death I dare you. That's what Paul is actually doing there. Sometimes I think what happens when we suffer, we waste our suffering by doing this. I am not trusting the Lord like I should while I'm suffering. I'm anxious. I'm worried. I'm short with my spouse or friends. And I'm sinning so much. I don't even know if I'm a Christian. It's amazing to me when people struggle with their assurance and then they ask me, have you ever struggled with your assurance? And I say, of course not, I've written books on it. (laughs) I don't say that. And I say, I'm laying there on my deathbed thinking I'm gonna die in the hospital. And I'm thinking, is my faith really enough? Do I really trust enough? Is there enough fruit in my life? Have I been evangelizing the nurses enough? I can't even pray now. Lord, am I really saved? And then by the Spirit's grace and power, you think that's not even the right way to talk. That's not the right way to think. Because it's not my faith. It's the object of my faith. It's God has shown me He loves me. And it's God who's shown me that my sins have been paid for and Jesus has earned my righteousness and I stand before God as righteous as Jesus. I'm as righteous as John Bunyan in heaven who's righteous. Nobody's more righteous. You begin to ask yourself the right questions and you work through and you think, Lord, you have my attention. I want to suffer well and I need to make sure I keep thinking about forgiveness of sins through a mediator via the resurrection, not how great my faith is. Is there anything even perfect in this world? Not one thing. How can your faith be perfect? And when you struggle with your faith and you struggle with your assurance, I'd kind of like to know who gave you that struggle. Satan? Probably CNN did. It's the Spirit of God in you crying out, Abba, Father, I'm hurting. My deathbed prayer was one thing because I couldn't think of anything else. Help. Help. If you have a child that's sick, in our family, and this is my wife's doing, she would make something, she'd say, let me make you a little nest on the couch. Special blanket, special food, special everything, doting, watching, 
praying, comforting, rubbing. I have a hurting child. They get extra attention. I wonder if a sinful mom and dad who does that could be exceeded by a God in heaven who gives extra attention, as it were, to those who are suffering. I wonder if that could be possible. Secondly, second takeaway, would you read Job this week? I want you to read Job this week. And I want you to ask yourself the question, when my questions aren't answered, what's that doing to me intellectually? It's making me say, I'm looking for answers. I can't find answers. I can't get myself out of this trial. Where do I turn? And the answer is, the just shall live by faith. When you can't find answers, the book of Job will drive you to the one who has all the answers and the questions. When you're hurting, when you're struggling, especially read Job 38, 39, and 41. Because now God is asking the questions, and Job has to give the answers. And he realizes he doesn't have all the answers, but he realizes who God is. Which leads me to number three. When you're suffering, or when you're helping someone suffer, don't ask why, ask who. Why, 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 why? You know when you're a little kid and you start asking the questions, you can just keep asking why after every single question. Why? Because daddy told you not to. Why? Why, why, why? Jerry Bridges' book, Trusting God, is really good for this, especially even in the book of Job. You ask why, God asks, let me tell you who I am. We don't know all the answers. He's not going to give us all the answers. Did you know Job? only found out God's and Satan's discussion when he went to heaven? He wasn't even told. He didn't even know about Satan and God. One writer said, instead of becoming forlorn regarding the inability to give your congregation complete answers to the questions raised by the book of Job, you can instead rejoice in this reality because the absence of answers leads us directly to Jesus. You see, ultimately, the questions raised by Job regarding the mystery of evil and the cause of human suffering only find their answer in the cross of Christ. The questions to the answers raised by the book of Job are answered in the question of Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Turn to Job 42. About ready to land this plane. Job 42. Remember early on I said there's a lot of, of the word comfort in Job? Yes, there's a lot of suffering, but there's a lot of comfort found in Job. And it's very interesting if you look at Job 42, verses 1 through 6. Job 42, 1 to 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Good response or bad response? Not a trick question. I'm not Pat Abendroth, I don't trick. I'm Boston. We stab people in the chest, not, <laughs> not in the back. <laughs> Massachusetts, where even Republicans are Democrats. Now, some of you might have certain study Bibles that give you some insight on the translation in verse 6 of chapter 42. ESV says, therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Most translations say repent. But you know, you can translate that word repent because it's the same root word. You can translate that in English with the word comfort. Did you know that? The word comfort. One study Bible says, now that God has spoken, Job can say that he is comforted in dust and ashes. When Job's relatives and friends come to comfort him 
in 42.11, this is probably ironic, Job found the comfort he needed in the vision of God's unsearchable wisdom. I despise myself and I'm comforted in dust and ashes. I know who you are, God. I know your wisdom is right. I know I don't have to know everything. I'm trusting you to provide everything I need from forgiveness to a mediator to a resurrection. And I'm comforted in dust and ashes. That's a good way to translate it. Do the righteous suffer? Of course. Do we have all the answers? Of course not. Final takeaway. How much joy do you think Job would have had if he had the book of Hebrews? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if he had the book of Hebrews? He has all these questions. He doesn't know the answers. He foreshadows. He's got the right questions. The Spirit of God has him ask those questions. If only Job had Hebrews, how happy would he be? He'd know that there's forgiveness of sins. Jesus purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of God. Chapter 1, verse 3. He would know there's a mediator because the whole book is about Jesus, the high priest. Chapter 8, verse 1, we, the point of what we're saying is this, that we have Jesus Christ, the high priest. He would know about the resurrection because seated at the right hand of the Father is Jesus. And in chapter 13, there's a resurrection. Job would say, God cares for me even though I suffer. God loves me even though I suffer. God notices even though I suffer because I've got Jesus Christ, the one who forgave my sins, who's my high priest, who chapter 7 says, who lives to make intercession for me. And chapter 13 says, he's been raised from the dead. That's my Savior. If Job only had it, he'd be joyful. You have the book of Job. And you have the book of Hebrews. If Job could have joy and hope, ten children lost. I know people here have had trials, and I don't want to make light of any single trial, but I can't think of a trial greater than that. Ten And he could have joy in the midst of trials, in the midst of suffering. I wanted to step down and walk off, but like Columbo, I want to say there's just one more thing. You can know God loves you and cares for you because there's forgiveness of sins in a mediator confirmed by the resurrection. And that's the path and the telegraphed pass of Job. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word in Job. We're thankful for the Lord Jesus, truly God and truly man. We're thankful that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, and in response, help us to hold fast our confession. Father, I struggle with joy. I struggle with comfort. I struggle with anxiety. I'm sure these people do as well. What comfort do we get from knowing all this? Father, give us eternal joy. Give us bliss, happiness, and mouths ready to tell people that they can have their forgiveness through a mediator who is raised from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen.